Uh, good afternoon, dear chairman and colleagues. Uh, my name is Seda Jantuhanova. I'm presenting Vishnevsky National Scientific uh, Surgical Center in Moscow. And I'm going, uh, concluding the session on minimal evasive esophageal surgery. I'm going to talk about short esophagus. So we have a lot of myths in life, but why are we talking about myth or reality in surgery? It's just because still it's one of the controversial topics when we are talking about the short esophagus. And still, I meet a lot of surgeons who just don't believe in short esophagus. They do believe in the incomplete mobilization. So I have a question for you. How many people in this room believe that short esophagus do exist? Just raise your hand. Cool. Thank you. So let's clear up. And I want to start with an interesting fact. When I made a research on this topic, it turned out that uh, the entity of short esophagus in antireflex surgery is seldom discussed in the laparoscopic surgery, in laparoscopic literature, despite its emphasis in the open literature for more than 40 years. This implied to the fact that many laparoscopic patients with short esophagus are frequently undiagnosed, may be treated inappropriately. So I have one more question. What do you think this shark is doing on one of my first slides? And the answer is pretty simple. Shark have the shortest esophagus among, among all live beings. Just imagine two, three centimeters in comparison to the whole GI system. Is that short? Not really. It's normal. It's normal for a shark. And what about the humans? So let's go to the terminology. What do we actually mean by the short esophagus? It turned out that the most of the esophagi that considered to be short on preoperative studies are actually of normal length. So it's helpful to think about short esophagus as evaluated intraoperatively in OR as falling to three types. The apparent short esophagus, which is accordioned unto itself in the distal mediastinum. And this one can be easily reduced with no, with no any dissection. So the true short esophagus is the second one. This can be reduced with extensive mediastinal dissection. However, a few short esophagi are non-reducible, and this one is required as a phagogastroplasty. So what about the preoperative status? The preoperative status that should raise your, your suspicion for a short esophagus are outlined on this slide. However, these are only uh, indicators that should raise your index of suspicion, especially if you have a patient with previously failed antireflex operation. The history and presence of peptic stricture of Barrett's esophagus. And of course, the large five centimeters or more type one hiatal hernia that fails to reduce in the upright position. So the preoperative assessment should include CAT scan, upper GI endoscopy, and barium swallow. But you need to know that all of these studies does not differentiate between the types which were listed on the previous slide. Because in all of these studies, they will show that the G junction is located at or above the diaphragm. So the only way to differentiate between this type is the intraoperative assessment during dissection of the distal esophagus. So intraoperative assessment is a crucial point. And you can do that with the open width of the standard dissector and use this open instrument as a gauge to assess the length of the distal esophagus. And if there's any confusion about the location of D-junction, intraoperative endoscopy should be used. So why short esophagus is so frequently undiagnosed? Because two common mistakes. Aggressive actual traction of the stomach without adequately mobilizing the mediastinal esophagus. And the second, performing a fund application properly around the distal esophagus when D-junction is retracted below the diaphragm under the tension. So we all like the guidelines, as everything is based on them. So the guidelines for uh, treatment of hiatal hernia, the SAGES guidelines from 2013, 
It says that the necessary step of hiatal hernia repair is to return the G-junction to infradiaphragmatic position. And at the completion of hiatal repair, the intra-abdominal esophagus should measure at least two, three centimeter length to decrease the chance of recurrence. And this length can be act achieved by combination of mediastinal dissection of the esophagus and the gastroplasty. And this is the strong position. So, about 40 years ago, there was described a different procedures for short esophagus, including the circular myotomy, esophagectomy, and transabdominal or transthoracic procedures, including the lengthening procedures. And most of them were really uh, difficult techniques with a high rate of complication. And we will skip all of them and we'll stop at the lengthening procedure, the colis gastroplasty, which is considered to be the standard of treatment for short esophagus nowadays. But I want to mention that the colis procedure, with the, which aim initially was to substitute esophagectomy in 1957, uh, initially it was not um, accomplished with fund application, but it, it did not control the reflex. So later on it was accomplished with the fund application, among which the colis nissen is considered the standard for now. And initially the procedure of uh, colis was, to, the aim of the procedure was to divide the stomach between two clamps in order to uh, create the gastric tube. So, the important technical step of colis nissen uh, are outlined on the slide, and mobilization of fundus dividing the short gastric vessels, the bad shape resection, the forming of the sharp angle to prevent the problems with subsequent fund application. And of course, the length of the gastric tube is really crucial. So, it's um, three centimeters of neoesophagus is really a good length, and the two centimeters of fund application. So, uh, talking about results, a large retrospective study uh, comparing two groups of patients with colis and non-colis procedure was, uh, were uh, evaluated and it showed that the length of procedures is really uh, higher in the first group, but the colis uh, procedure is um, uh, considered to, be, to have the same quality of life scores as non-colis procedure, but the higher rate of complications. So we do have a problems, risk, and side effects still, like non-standardized preparative way to evaluate the short esophagus, the leaks, dysphagia, the reflex problems. So the uh, accurate selection of the patient to this procedure is really, really important. So the question is, when will we do colis? So we need to um, evaluate carefully the patient during a surgery. So the first step is the type 1 abdominal dissection. So we should mobilize to 4 centimeters of distal esophagus and assess intra-abdominal esophageal length. So if the length is less than 2.5 or 3 centimeters of intra-abdominal esophagus, which usually happens in 10% of the patient, you should perform type 2 mediastinal dissection and reassess intra-abdominal esophageal length. And if it's still less than three centimeters, then you should perform colis gastroplasty. And this happened only in 5% of the patient. And as an example, I want to show you two clinical cases from our own experience. And this is, these are the two different patients. The first patient underwent a colis and gastroplasty as the first uh, surgery, so it was performed in the first place. And the second patient underwent the colis nissen gastroplasty as the secondary procedure. It was actually the redo surgery at the patient with a recurrent hernia. So the first patient was a male with uh, uh, 45 years old with a gastroesophageal reflux disease and hiatal hernia with a long-lasting history of heartburn. So the short esophagus was identified intraoperatively and nissen colis gastroplasty was performed initially at the first, uh, first step. So here you can see the steps of the um, mobilization of the fundus of the stomach, dividing the short uh, gastric vessels. And we usually start um, traditionally as, at a, as a classic uh, procedure for hiatal hernia repair, mobilizing the uh, upper stomach, mobilizing the left and right crews. Here you can see the reduction of the stomach into abdominal cavity. 
And here we can see the right crews in uh, we um, perform right now on the video the um, suturing of the right and left crews, diaphragmography. And then the step of the colonism uh, procedure or uh, creation of the gastric tube, because the length of the esophagus is uh, 1.5 centimeters, you can see here on this video. So we lengthen the uh, esophagi. by creating the gastric tube with endoscopic staplers and the second step of the procedure, we perform the Nissan fund application, as you can see on the video. And the next patient is a male with a uh, male 62 years old with a recurrent hiatal hernia and the symptoms of rap entrapment. The short esophagus was identified intraoperatively during revision surgery, and the Nissan colon gastroplasty was performed during uh, as a redo surgery. Here you can see the steps of um, lysis of adhesions uh, at the site of the first surgery, initial surgery, which was a hiatal hernia repair with a Nissan fund application. Here you can see we're trying to mobilize the um, stomach and the uh, Nissan uh, wrap and the esophagus. Here you can see the wrap. We completely mobilize the stomach from the wrap using the ultrasonic scissors. And when we perform the um, hiatal hernia repair, in the, um, considering the fact that this is the recurrent hernia, we uh, also reinforce the hiatus with the mesh. We really uh, use the mesh very rarely, but in the recurrent hernia, we do prefer to use a mesh to reinforce the hi hiatus. And after that, we uh, perform, uh, next step is performing the um, Nissan colis gastroplasty. Again, once again, dividing the stomach uh, with the creation of the gastric tube. And this patient, uh, the recurrence of the hernia in this patient was uh, because the uh, short esophagus was not diagnosed at the first place. And after the lengthening step of procedure, we do um, accomplish the colis gastroplasty with the Nissan font application. Just the same way as in the first patient. So as a take home message, I want to say that uh, when you do the uh, head or hernia repairs, you should be prepared for the worst in all cases. Uh, it's not an easy surgery. So if you're already there and unsure, back out. If you're considering and not sure, help, get help or refer out. And learn to operate below and above the diaphragm. Or be sure you have someone who can. And never ever hesitate to ask for help when needed. Thank you once again for the invitation and the privilege of the podium. And I want to invite you back to Moscow in December as yesterday. So you're very welcome to come to the sixth Moscow International Festival of Endoscopy and Surgery. Thank you.